Hi, it's a uh, great pleasure today to, uh, to introduce a distinguished writer. Uh, as you have no doubt read from his biography, he's from Ireland, but he does speak good English. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you what's on his biography because you can read that. But, you know, what we have in these luncheons is a, uh, a writer who speaks about a recently published book. His book actually isn't out yet. It'll be out shortly. But there are reviews of it out there. And um, I think it is very interesting to find a subject in which literature has become a tool of intelligence activity. And that's what his book is about. And I would like to read a short paragraph to you. Uh, there's a, uh, an, a website out which uh, says there are eight books that you should read this summer. And Peter Finn's book is one of them. And this is, this is what it says about it. A work of deep historical research that reads a little like Le Carre. This is the backstory of the foreign publication of Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago, and it bears its multiple burdens lightly a sideways biography of Pasternak, a psychological history <coughs> of Soviet Russia, a powerful argument for the book as literature, an entry into the too small canon of the CIA's, CIA's role in shaping culture. In new reporting on the agency's distribution of the book behind enemy lines, the authors show how both sides in the Cold War used literary prestige as a weapon without resorting to cheap moral equivalency. This is a, a fascinating uh, story to me. I've never seen uh, another article or another work which actually describes the way that intelligence activities are able to use culture, uh, and, and in this particular case, literature, as a tool in the Cold War. So without further ado, I'd like to, uh, Peter Finn to come up and tell you about uh, his book himself. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to speak to you. Um, in early September 1958, uh, copies of a Russian language edition of Dr. Shivago appeared on the grounds of the Brussels World's Fair. It was a very fine edition, substantial, bound in blue linen. It was also very odd because there was no known publisher of Dr. Shivago in Russian. The novel was banned in the Soviet Union, and its first Western publisher, who controlled the rights, Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli of Milan, had not contracted for an original language edition. The novel was being handed out to Soviet visitors to the Vatican Pavilion, and those handsome covers were soon littering the fairgrounds as some of those who got the book ripped off the heavy cover <clears throat> to make it easier to stuff in their pockets. The v visitors who got copies from Russian-speaking priests and lay volunteers understood it was an illicit book best hidden from the KGB minders at the fair in Brussels. The CIA, working with Dutch intelligence, was behind this publication, which was printed by Mouton and Company, a distinguished house in The Hague. The agency saw Brussels as an ideal place to distribute the book because an unusually large number of Soviet citizens, some 16,000, had obtained visas to visit the World's Fair, which took place over six months between April and October 1958 at a 500-acre site just northwest of central Brussels. Forty-two nations, including the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and for the first time, the Vatican, participated. The agency assumed that the Dutch publishing house Mouton, which specialized in Slavic language books, was about to get the rights to the Russian language version of Dr. Shivago from Feltrinelli, and that this edition would be passed off as an early run. There was good reason for this belief. Mouton itself also thought it would get the rights from Milan. For the Mouton who, executive who agreed to print Shivago, this was simply a very profitable an early sale, 
even though he knew that the whole thing was fishy and almost certainly involved intelligence operatives. The deal with Fil Feltrinelli was not finalized, however, and the CIA addition, unexpectedly, became a pirate one. About 1,100 copies were printed. That screw-up sparked immediate speculation about who was behind the printing, and the rumors continued for decades. Der Spiegel, the German magazine, noted almost immediately in 1958 that one of the volunteers at the Vatican Pavilion was, quote, associated with a militant American cultural and propaganda organization which goes under the name of Committee for a Free Europe. A New York Times book columnist wondered aloud who was behind the Russian edition of Dr. Zhivago and said coyly the answer was, quote, classified. On November 15, 1958, the CIA was first linked by name to the printing in the National Review Bulletin, a newsletter supplement for contributors to the National Review, the magazine founded by William F. Buckley, Jr. In Moscow, the National Review reported, these books were passed hand to hand as avidly as a copy of Fanny Hill in a college dormitory. The speculation continued for years, some of it quite fanciful, that British intelligence forced down a plane in Malta that was carrying the Italian publisher Feltrinelli from Moscow, and MI6 officers secretly photographed the manuscript of Dr. Shivago, which was in his luggage. The only problem was that Feltrinelli had only once been to Moscow, and that was before the novel was finished by Pasternak. And when he did pick it up in September 1956, it was in West Berlin, and flights from Berlin to Milan don't travel over Malta. It was also speculated that the CIA published the novel in Russian to satisfy a rule of the Swedish Academy that a work must be published in its original language to qualify for the Nobel Prize in Literature. But the Academy has said that there is no such rule and there is no copy of the CIA edition in its library or archives. Indeed, an internal CIA accounting of where the books were sent after they were printed in the Netherlands show that none went to Stockholm. Still others argued that the CIA's role was minimal, and this was all the work of emigre organizations the agency sponsored. Bottom line, there was lots of speculation, but very few facts. I came to the story in Moscow in 2007, where I was a correspondent for the Washington Post, I wrote a story about a Russian writer's claim that the CIA published Dr. Zhivago in Russian to win the Nobel Prize for Pasternak. As I noted, that was inaccurate. But at the time, I began to read about Pasternak and Dr. Zhivago, the decade Pasternak spent writing it, his deeply ambivalent relationship with the Soviet state, and the strange bond between him and Stalin, even though they only spoke once and on the phone his messy private life. He had essentially two families. Um, the state never imprisoned Pasternak, but they did strike at him indirectly by putting his mistress in the gulag twice. The early hostile reaction to the novel from the state publisher and literary journals such as Novi Mir, Pasternak's decision to give the manuscript to a young Italian, Sergio D'Angelo, who worked at Radio Moscow, and who also worked as a scout for new books for Feltrinelli. The efforts of the Kremlin in conjunction with the Italian Communist Party to intimidate both the author and the publisher, stop publication in Milan and get the book back, the extraordinary correspondence between Feltrinelli and Pasternak, which is a testament to artistic freedom. Feltrinelli broke with the Italian Communist Party, of which he was a leading member and financier, and was the first publisher of Dr. Zhivago, uh, which appeared in translation in Italy in November 1957. It was a commercial and critical success, helped in part by the fact that the Soviets had banned it, something that was noted in almost all the press coverage in the West. Indeed, I think there's a case to be made that if the Soviet Union had simply allowed a small print run and made no fuss at all, Dr. Zhivago would have drawn a small elite audience in the West 
and not have become the international bestseller it did.